welcome everyone. Thanks for being here. I have no announcements, so I'll take your questions. Thank you. Uh, the Russians appear to have given the U.S. some information in recent days that they had from 2011 about Tamerlan Zornayev and his mother. Is the president concerned at all that the U.S. didn't have this information before the Boston bombings happened? Well, I don't have any confirmation to give you about the content of information the Russians may or may not have been giving us in recent days. The FBI has put out some information about the alert that the Russian authorities gave to uh, U.S. authorities uh, in the past on two different occasions and uh, made clear the actions that they took in response to that information. We uh, have a cooperative relationship with uh, our Russian counterparts when it comes to counterterrorism. We have an ongoing conversation with uh, Russian uh, officials on this specific matter, the bombing in Boston. As you know, we have been cooperating with uh, the Russian uh, government on travel from the embassy by a team uh, of Americans to investigate uh, down in uh, Dagestan the, the trip that Tamerlan Tsarnaev took. Uh, uh, and, that, and that cooperation continues. But I, I don't have, since these are matters that are under investigation at this time, I don't have specific details about what, you know, what information is being passed back and forth. Is the President comfortable with the level of information in general that the Russians provided to the U.S. before the bombings? I don't have a characterization of the President's views on this. I can tell you that uh, cooperation like this is important, and it is the, the kind of cooperation that we have with uh, governments around the world and uh, allies and partners around the world uh, because the uh, terrorism threat is a global problem, not a national one. And uh, that kind of information sharing is, is extremely valuable when it comes to combating terrorism. Uh, both in this country and around the world. Would the President be concerned if the Russians had withheld any information that could have, at the very least, led the FBI to do a more extensive investigation? Well, that's a, you know, a couple levels of speculation. I think the President hopes and expects that uh, we are uh, able to share information back and forth with uh, governments uh, on a variety of uh, counterterrorism subjects. And this, this is the kind of thing that it's obviously uh, very important that we have uh, that kind of cooperation from other governments on. Uh, and we provide it as well, of course. So I, I don't want to characterize too much the nature of conversations or information sharing on this case uh, with the Russians uh, beyond what the FBI has already discussed. I can tell you that obviously the President has spoken with uh, President Putin and uh, will continue to have conversations, of course, with uh, his counterpart there as our governments cooperate on this matter and other issues. On a separate topic, um, NBA player Jason Collins announced today that he's gay. Does the President have any response or any reaction to that announcement? I haven't spoken with him about it. I can certainly tell you that uh, here at the White House, you know, we view that as another example of the progress that has been made and the, and the, and the evolution that has been taking place in this country and, and uh, commend him for his courage. Uh, and support him in his, uh, you know, uh, in this effort and, and, and hope that his fans and his team uh, support him going forward. Yes. Hey, on Syria, um, some questions are being raised about whether uh, the Syrians actually used sarin on their people. What uh, confidence does the United States have in this evidence? And can you characterize what exactly the evidence is in any way and what standards you're trying to meet in terms of establishing it? We have established with varying degrees of confidence that chemical weapons were used in uh, limited fashion in Syria. And the, the agent is sarin, as we have said. Uh, we have some physiological uh, tests that are part of that uh, collection of evidence. But there is much more to be done to uh, verify conclusively that the red line that the President has talked about has been crossed. And it's very important that we take uh, the information that's been gathered thus far and build upon it, because uh, an assessment of varying degrees of confidence is not sufficient to, uh, upon which to base a policy reaction, as we've said. 
and as the President said uh, in the Oval Office on Friday. So uh, our work continues. We have a team, or the United Nations has a team, ready to deploy to Syria uh, within 24 to 48 hours. Uh, if Assad allows that team in and follows through on his stated commitment and interest in having this matter investigated. Uh, and we are working with the French and the British uh, and, and other allies and partners uh, to gather more evidence. Uh, chain of custody is an important issue, establishing uh, not just that there was an incident of chemical weapons use, but the um, how the exposure occurred, under what circumstances, who specifically was responsible, and again, the chain of custody, what, you know, how the, uh, how the incident itself uh, was brought about. When you say physiological, can you be any more specific about what that evidence is and who is holding it? Physiological is, is uh, tangible evidence. Beyond that, I'm not going to be specific about it or, or, or methods and sources in terms of gathering evidence. Uh, it is a piece in uh, the puzzle that needs to be put together to establish the kind of verifiable, uh, reviewable, corroboratable uh, <laughs> yes, uh, evidence that can be corroborated uh, that we need to uh, establish as we make decisions about policy. And can I ask on uh, budget issues, was the White House surprised at how quickly Congress moved last week to provide flexibility to the FAA to prevent flight delays? and? Having set that precedent, how can the White House hold out any hope for reversing the sequester this year? Well, we were glad to see uh, Congress sufficiently concerned about the negative effects of the sequester on uh, our air travelers that they were uh, willing to do something about it. The fact that that is what it took reinforces what we have been saying, which is that Congress failed to eliminate the sequester. It is Congress. It is within Congress's power to uh, reverse that decision, take action in a balanced way to reduce our deficit and replace the sequester. This was not our ideal solution because the money involved in solving this problem at the FAA makes up less than one half of one percent of the more than eighty billion dollars uh, that the sequester represents over seven months. And it is not the way to go about dealing with a law that never should have become law, that, or rather that never should be implemented. The sequester was designed purposefully to be uh, terrible policy, and we are seeing uh, in the, very, uh, the various impacts that it is having across the country uh, that it is, in fact, terrible policy. And while we uh, are glad that Congress shared our concern, the concern that we warned them and the public about months in advance, when it came to uh, furloughs at the FAA and the effect that would have on travelers and the delays that that would cause, uh, we hope that Congress would show the same kind of unified passion when it came when it comes to helping families whose kids are getting kicked off of Head Start, or seniors who are losing access to the Meals on Wheels program, or uh, families whose uh, whose breadwinners have lost their jobs because they uh, are involved in defense industries or in military communities, or overall the 750,000 people who won't have jobs because uh, Congress decided, or Republicans speci uh, specifically decided, that sequester uh, was a good idea, a political victory, a way to shore up their base and, and uh, win praise from the Tea Party. Uh, bad policy begets uh, bad consequences, and that's what we're seeing. Uh, John. Jay, can you just tell me, on Syria, where exactly is that red line? <laughs> the President has made clear, as he did again Friday, that the use of chemical weapons or the transfer of chemical weapons to terrorist groups would cross a red line. What we have made clear, and we can go over it again, is that uh, we have established with varying degrees of confidence that there have been incidents of chemical weapons use, sarin in particular, in a limited fashion in, in, in Syria. We are now working to uh, build upon that evidence to uh, increase the amount of evidence to find uh, specifically what happened, what occurred, who was responsible, uh, and, and, and build that case, if you will. 
So is it the use of any amount of chemical weapons? You know, I, I, there's, there's not a, uh, a gradation here that I can engage in. I can tell you that the, there have been, as we have assessed with varying degrees of confidence, uh, incidents of the use of chemical weapons in a limited fashion. But the issue here is chain of custody. It is uh, going on more than simply intelligence assessments. I think our history is, uh, provides us with examples of why uh, we need to be uh, especially assiduous when it comes to evaluating and gathering evidence uh, in matters related to these kinds of issues. Uh, and that's what we're doing. But, but I'm trying to understand, because I heard the President say <coughs> systematic use on Friday. So is it any amount? Is it a small amount? Does it have to be a large amount to cross the red line? If a I think that the issue here is the use by, we believe, the regime, because we uh, are highly skeptical of any accusations that the opposition may have used chemical weapons, the use by the regime uh, of chemical weapons against the Syrian people, or the transfer by the regime of some of its chemical weapons stack, stockpile to terrorists. Oh, yeah, I, I don't have an amount to give you. Obviously, the, uh, the nature of chemical weapons uh, varies depending on the agent. The use of chemical weapons very, you know, it can depend on uh, the instance uh, and the uh, chain of custody. So uh, that's what we're investigating now. That's what we're calling on Assad to allow the United Nations to investigate. So uh, this is a very serious matter. The President made clear this is a very serious matter. And it, be, it is because that it is so serious that it is essential to uh, establish uh, you know, a broader process of verification uh, that will allow us then to assess whether that red line has been crossed and what the uh, policy response will be. And on chain of custody, mm -hmm. does it have to be something that is directed by the Assad, by, by Assad and his... We have his said that leaders? use by oh, the regime, yeah, we have said that use by the regime of chemical weapons is, would be President Assad's responsibility. And uh, we believe and have, have assessed that the chemical weapons stockpiles uh, in Syria are uh, under the control of, continue to be under the control of the Syrian regime led by uh, Bashar al-Assad. Uh, again, I, I don't want to speculate on the incidents that we have assessed with varying degrees of confidence uh, have occurred or may have occurred. Uh, we are further investigating all credible uh, you know, information about possible use of chemical weapons in Syria and call on Assad to uh, comply with his own uh, request for an investigation of chemical weapons use in Syria by allowing that team in to investigate it's ready to go. And just one more, mm -hmm. how long do you think this process takes? Are we I don't think it's, getting, I don't think it's possible to say necessarily because uh, building the, uh, e the building blocks that, you know, create the uh, evidence necessary to make these kinds of assessment uh, depend on what we're able to gather and, and it's a complex process. Establishing the use of chemical weapons and the incidents involved in the chain of custody is not easy business, but it is essential business. Again, if you're as serious as the President is about uh, this kind of uh, transgression, if it were to occur, uh, you need to be uh, sure of your facts and you need to have facts, uh, facts that, are, that, you can, that can be corroborated and that can be reviewed uh, and uh, that are airtight. So realistically, it could be weeks, it could be months. I don't have a timetable for you. I would, I would not uh, give you a timetable. Yeah. There's a fairly widespread concern out there that the White House is manipulating the sequestered on various fronts, the FAA, Head Start. You mean widespread concern among, like on the chat shows by Republicans, but beyond that? Well, beyond the Republicans and probably other people mm -hmm. too. You've got to give them some credit, you know. It might not just be the Republicans. Well, I haven't heard anybody uh, who's lost uh, uh, a slot in Head Start suggests that that's because uh, anybody here wished it to happen. We've been pretty clear that the Congress needs to act. The fact that the Congress acted, was able to act on the FAA, demonstrates that this is a problem that Congress needs to solve, and we call on them to do it. When people look at this, it becomes clear that when it's simply a matter of reprogramming funds from one pocket to another, which, which is something that means nothing to most people, mm -hmm. and yet <clears throat> average Americans are being inconvenience or worse by the sequester and I find it difficult to believe I think in many cases not restricted to the Republican right mm -hmm. that you couldn't do more about it. Mm -hmm. Well Bill I appreciate the question and I think it's really important that, that uh, reporters when they report on the sequester because it is complicated uh, lay out these facts clearly. Congress had to pass a law because it was not possible legally to simply 
reprogram funds. That was established clearly, which is why Congress had to act. The sequester is written in a way that makes that, uh, to be, that, makes that the case. Congress had to act. That's why uh, Congress did pass the measure that has fixed the problem within the FAA. The sequester was written in a way to make it bad policy, and that is why we are seeing the impacts that we have seen. Um, what is also the case is that 80 plus billion dollars in cuts in seven months uh, cannot be, uh, you know, wished away through, you know, moving around some funds. There, as, as Secretary uh, Duncan has said about uh, funding for education department programs, uh, the choice would be uh, if that flexibility even existed. Uh, do I help poor kids or do I help disabled kids? Uh, that is not how it is supposed to work. That is not how policy should work. And that's why Congress ought to do the responsible thing and eliminate the sequester by adopting the kind of broad, balanced deficit reduction package that the President supports and that the very American people that you've mentioned support. Yeah, but when you frame it like that, do I help poor kids or disabled kids, it looks as though you are framing it in a way to make it least palatable to the public. I, I'm not isn't sure. I, there, isn't there something else that can be done, people might ask? Well, they might, and it would be your job, I think, and all of our job, to explain to them that this was written in a way to make it impossible to do that unless you eliminate the sequester. That was the case with the FAA funding uh, problem. It required an act of Congress to allow for uh, funds that by law were not, they were, you know, we within the administration, the FAA, was not able to transfer without Congress acting. Uh, and, and that kind of scenario is replayed uh, every time you look at this problem, which is why we have the problem, uh, in addition to the fact that Congress seems to be unwilling, or Republicans in Congress seem to be unwilling to ask uh, millionaires and billionaires to give up some special tax breaks uh, in order to avert the kinds of negative effects that the sequester is having now on uh, regular folks out there. Brianna. There's a report in the New York Times today um, citing current and former advisors to President Hamid Karzai who they say that suitcases, backpacks, sometimes even plastic grocery bags of cash would come on an almost monthly basis to the President's office. Um, did President Obama approve that? I don't, I, I have no information on that report and I would refer you to uh, the CIA for any questions on it. I can tell you that uh, you know, as we have said uh, many times, we and our Afghan partners remain committed to our shared strategy and goals of a fully sovereign Afghanistan that is not a safe haven for Al Qaeda and that is responsible for its own security. That's why the President has put in place a policy where after uh, plussing up forces there uh, we, uh, and, and training uh, Afghan national security forces, we are now drawing down American forces, keeping the President's commitment to do so as we uh, transfer security lead over to the Afghans. President aware of these CIA payments? Again, you're making an assertion about something that I, I have no comment on. Um, American officials in the story say that actually the money didn't go to buy influence as it was initially intended, that it actually fueled corruption. Does the White House have any reaction to that? Again, I don't have any specific comment on this. But um, The President's heading to Mexico and Costa Rica this week. Mm -hmm. Can you talk broadly about some of his goals and then specifically with Mexico, what his message is on immigration reform while he's there? Well, uh, we will have more information about the trip the President's making later in the week. Uh, his visits to this region are always significant because of uh, the President's uh, commitment to uh, expanding our economic uh, ties to the countries of Latin America. Uh, that's very much a part of this trip. Our relationship with Mexico is especially vital and important economically and culturally and, uh, and in other ways, uh, and that uh, remains the case. The, when it comes to immigration reform, I think that uh, the President's uh, message is less specific to his visit here than it is generally uh, to, uh, in that it's about the need to reform a system that uh, is broken uh, and in doing so to uh, enhance our border security, hold our businesses accountable, uh, strengthen uh, the economy by uh, helping uh, those 11 million uh, people who are in this country illegally uh, provide for them a clear path uh, to citizenship and to enhance our national security by uh, having those folks enter the system. So, uh, you know, the broad principles that the President laid out a long time ago now uh, are the principles that guide him as he looks at the work that the Congress is doing, specifically so far that the Senate has done, 
and he is encouraged by the progress that has been made thus far. But we are still in the early stages of uh, seeing that bipartisan effort move its way through the Senate and hopefully move its way through uh, both houses so that it can land on the President's desk in a way that uh, meets his principles and he can sign it. Does he see this trip to Mexico? As a, can you talk about how he sees it? Is it a way to elevate this issue? What What is he hoping to get out of it in terms well, of... Well, I, I think our relationship with uh, the countries in Central America is uh, vital in many ways. It's certainly not limited uh, at all to the uh, matters of uh, immigration uh, reform in this country. That That's something that you can expect he'll talk about, but uh, because it's very topical here in, in the United States, and it is of interest to countries in the region. Uh, but our relationship with those countries uh, is vital in terms of our economic trade and other matters, uh, and I'm sure those will be topics as well. Yeah. Jay, I want to follow on Syria and John's questions about the timeline and whatnot. Understanding, as you say, that the evidence has to be airtight, because nobody su should suggest that the administration rush through this. If it takes months and months to verify this, or maybe a year, doesn't that keep the door wide open for Assad to use chemical weapons? I mean, if he, if, when the president was in the briefing room here some months ago, he made it seem like there, there will be action taken if this line is crossed. If it drags on for months and months, it seems like the door could be open for Assad to do this again. Well, I, I, I certainly appreciate the question, and uh, I understand it. What, what I won't do is speculate about how much time uh, might be required to uh, gather the evidence necessary to be able to assess clearly in a, in a way that can be corroborated and reviewed uh, whether or not this red line has been crossed. I think all Americans would hope and expect that on a matter of this seriousness that we would be very careful in that process uh, and would insist upon uh, gathering all the facts and not uh, rushing uh, to take action uh, in a policy sense in reaction to assessments that are very important uh, but are based on uh, incomplete information. So we need to build upon the excellent work that's been done thus far. Uh, we call upon Assad to allow the inspection team from the United Nations, United Nations in rather, to uh, conduct the investigation that Assad himself asked for. Uh, but we are not relying on the United Nations alone. We are working with our partners and allies, as well as the Syrian opposition, very importantly, to gather more facts and evidence uh, because this matter is so serious. Let me ask you a different question. Uh, d back here at home, Hurricane Sandy, obviously a lot of attention being focused to six months later. Uh, kind of a two-part. First being giving you the opportunity <coughs> to explain where you and the President think we are in rebuilding very important communities in America right now. Well, I appreciate that. It is uh, six months now since that terrible storm uh, devastated uh, New Jersey and New York and other parts of the country. And I can tell you that we continue to bring all resources to bear to support those affected by the storm as they continue to recover. In the last six months, FEMA has obligated more than $1 billion to support state and local rebuilding efforts and dispersed more than $1.3 billion directly to affected families covering eligible repair costs and meeting temporary housing needs, and that's in relation to the uh, major disaster declarations. Separately, after signing the $60 billion supplemental for Sandy aid, the administration has worked ex expeditiously, expeditiously rather, to get the first portion of that money out the door, and in February provided an additional $5.4 billion uh, to the affected states. Uh, also, the Sandy Task Force, led by HUD Secretary Sean Donovan, along with FEMA, uh, continues to work closely with our state and local partners as they make decisions about long-term rebuilding needs. On Friday, Secretary Donovan announced the approval of New York State's Recovery Action Plan. And today, Secretary Donovan joined Governor Christie of New Jersey to announce the approval of New Jersey's Recovery Action Plan. Now, we know there is more work to do. And the President committed at the time that uh, this administration would be uh, working with state and local authorities in support uh, of the recovery efforts long after the cameras went away. And not just when uh, there are anniversaries to mark. And that has been the case. And, uh, you know, this is very important business. And that's why the President asked Sean Donovan to head the task force. And he is uh, you know, making the progress that I just described, uh, as is FEMA and other elements involved in this effort. So then my question on that would be then, even after said, saying all that money's been put out there uh, in the pipeline, and Governor Christie, who has had very nice things <coughs> to say about the White House and the President, he himself in his interviews <coughs> saying, 
there are thousands of people who still have not had their homes built. So in fairness, the president's not going to be out there with a the hammer and nail. Sean Donovan's not going to be. We understand that. But what can be done, what needs to be done, so that this money actually gets to these people and their homes are actually rebuilt? Well, this money is getting to people, but you're right that there is enormous amount of work to be done. It has been six months, uh, half a year, since the storm. And there are people, as we have all uh, heard again or seen again today on this uh, six-month period uh, anniversary, uh, who are still suffering greatly from the impacts of that terrible storm, which is why uh, that work needs to continue uh, even when it's not an anniversary, and uh, why the President has made sure that through the task force and through the other levers that we have here at the Federal Government to assist these states, uh, that that work is being done. Peter, and then <coughs> Peter and Peter. If I can ask you quickly about the announcement that's going to be made at 210 today uh, about the Department of Transportation new nominee, very briefly, before I, on him specifically, if you can, are we going to hear about a Commerce Secretary or Trade Representative today, or is it just one individual today? Uh, I think we have the, uh, the announcement that you made uh, reference to uh, for the Secretary of Transportation today. Uh, I have no other personnel announcements to make. Uh, going back to Syria quickly, the Free Syrian Army over this weekend said that Israeli Air Force jets flew over Assad's palace and that they bombed a chemical weapons site near Damascus this weekend. Do you have any more information about that and what the message is to Israel? I, I don't have any information on that. And then finally, if I can quickly, as we speak about Syria, can, can you explain? There's some sense that the, the White House is perhaps out over its skis, to use a colloquial phrase, in terms of the issue on Syria, that the language that was used before to describe this red line or this being a game changer is now the policy doesn't meet that place, that the words perhaps got a little bit ahead of policy right now. If the White House wasn't 100 percent sure when they put out the information to the Hill late last week, why right now? Why not wait to have said something to have created this new complex situation? Well, I think, as you know, the President made clear uh, the fact that there was a red line for the United States long before. <coughs> Uh, this report came out because he was making clear to President Assad how seriously we would view the use or transfer of uh, serious chemical weapons. And uh, he made that clear again on Friday when asked about this in his meeting uh, with the King of Jordan. And that is why we have to be so uh, thorough in our review of and collection of evidence uh, to prove that chemical weapons have been used. Uh, and I think the American people would uh, expect nothing less. That's why, you know, we have made clear that while there is uh, some evidence that leads to an assessment of varying degrees of confidence that weapon, chemical weapons have been used in a limited way in Syria, more evidence needs to be gathered to uh, build upon the work that's been done thus far. And that includes uh, working with uh, allied allies and partners who uh, care deeply about this issue and have their own uh, assessments that have been made. It includes working very importantly with the Syrian opposition, and it includes urging President Assad to allow the United Nations uh, team into Syria. So given the challenge that's posed by the last part of your answer, which is Assad's willingness to allow inspectors mm -hmm. in there, if he doesn't allow inspectors in, as appears increasingly to be the case given that it hasn't happened to this point, can the White House or can this administration ever reach a point of certitude to know that chemical weapons are being used to, to mandate this reaction that the President has discussed, a game changer? I think that it is uh, certainly easier uh, if you were to have a team in the on, the gr on the ground uh, allowed entry by the Assad <coughs> regime. But we are not waiting for that process. We are moving forward, as we have already, to collect information and gather evidence. Uh, we are relying on and working with the Syrian opposition as well as our allies and partners in that effort, and that effort will continue. Uh, but uh, there is no question that this is uh, not easy business, and it needs to be thorough, uh, and we need to establish the highest possible level of confidence uh, in the assessments that we make, and that's why we're assembling the facts in the way that we are. Thank you, Jeff. Yes, Peter. Um, Vice President Biden often talks about how if you show him your budget, he can tell you what, he, what you value. Mm -hmm. uh, we hear him say that. So with respect to the sequester, would it be unfair for people to conclude that what Congress and the White House values is the convenience of air travelers as opposed to uh, Head Start recipients? I think it's fair to say that about Congress. We do not have independently the power to eliminate the sequester, either in piecemeal fashion or in its entirety. If we did have that power, uh, we would have exercised it, and we would pass uh, a budget uh, very much like the one that the President submitted that eliminates the sequester 
achieves $4.3 trillion in deficit reduction in a balanced way, invests in our economy, helps the middle class grow and thrive, and protects our seniors. Republicans in Congress chose a different path. Although late last year, just a few months ago, the Speaker of the House said that uh, through a process of tax reform, up to a trillion dollars in revenue could be generated from the wealthy and well-connected uh, and applied towards deficit reduction. He now says, no way, no how. And uh, that's unfortunate, because the only responsible way to reduce our deficit that doesn't ask seniors to bear the burden alone or middle-class families trying to educate their kids or small businesses or other uh, regular folks out in the country and economy to, to bear this burden alone, uh, you know, they have, they have said no, and that's, an, that, and, and that's unfortunate. So, yes, the, the decision by Congress to act swiftly to alleviate the uh, uh, delays being caused by the furloughs at, at the FAA, I think, demonstrates a level of concern for uh, some people who are affected by the sequester that we wish and the President wishes would be, uh, uh, you know, applied elsewhere to other Americans who are suffering from these effects and to the economy as a whole, because it's important to remember that, you know, it can be viewed as a, a political tactic or uh, something in your pocket, as John Boehner said, uh, to play in, 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 the, in the Beltway games with the White House and Democrats, or you can view, view it as something that's costing us up to three-quarters of a million jobs and a half a percentage point of economic growth. Uh, and then you have to ask yourself, am I doing, if I'm supporting this so that I can support the Tea Party or avert a primary challenge, am I actually uh, doing right by average Americans out there uh, who are having to bear the brunt of this decision. Well, could the President have made an important symbolic statement by saying, you know what, what I value are these other groups affected by the sequester. I'm going to veto this bill and uh, we're not going to pass it or I'm not going to sign it unless until these other groups are also protected. Well, Peter, the Secretary of Transportation, Ray LaHood, stood before you here months ago and made clear that this would be one of the effects. And I think in doing so, we made clear that this was an effect uh, that we thought would be of great concern to Congress and to the American people. Uh, unfortunately, because Republicans chose to embrace the sequester, we now have seen that effect uh, play out in airports across the country. And we welcome the decision by Congress to uh, take action to eliminate this portion of uh, the harm being caused to the American people. But uh, let's be clear, that's not our preferred approach. And a, a piecemeal approach is not the way to do it. If you, if, you, if you just do the math here, this was one half of 1 percent of the sequester, less than that. If you were to do it on average at that basis and try to eliminate the sequester piecemeal, you'd have to have more than 200 acts of Congress. Well, that doesn't happen, right? Uh, so the easier, smarter way to do it is to eliminate the sequester and replace it with good policy, balanced, fair, sensible policy, including smart cuts, including smart entitlement reforms, including tax reform that generates revenue that can be applied to deficit reduction. Uh, that's the way to go about it. That's what every bipartisan commission that has looked at this says is the way to go about it. That's the way uh, every iteration of the Simpson-Bowles uh, uh, report says we should go about it. Uh, Republican senators have said, uh, many of them, that that's the way we should go about it. So the President hopes that through his conversations with Republican lawmakers that we can find some common ground here to uh, to do it in this way that eliminates the sequester and helps our economy. Hey. A uh, little off topic, but uh, today, uh, with the uh, announcement of the uh, Charlotte Mayor as the Transportation Secretary, the uh, cabinet is kind of taking shape at this point. Is the President satisfied that his cabinet this time around uh, represents the diversity of the American people and the diversity of the Electoral Coalition? that actually got him elected to the White House? The, the President believes uh, that diversity is very important because diversity in his cabinet and among his uh, top advisors uh, improves the decision-making process, improves the inputs, and therefore improves uh, his capacity to uh, deliberate and make the best decisions possible uh, when it comes to policy for the country. And he is pleased with the individuals who have agreed to accept his nominations for positions in the Cabinet, uh, those positions that have opened up because uh, of folks leaving. Uh, and obviously there are other uh, nominations still to come. Uh, the, the, and I think that, uh, you know, what you will see is a, a Cabinet that reflects uh, the diversity of the country and reflects the, the quality of people who uh, are willing to serve their country in these important uh, positions.
Does this kind of look like America in the sort of proportions um, that there are? You know, I think that the focus here is on uh, making sure that uh, diversity is part of uh, the, the uh, in, you know, the, the, uh, what is sought in picking uh, senior advisors to the president, and I think that's reflected in the choices he's made. Uh, and I think that the quality of personnel who have agreed to, to serve the country in his cabinet reflects uh, the president's mm -hmm. insistence that mm -hmm. uh, he get the very best people in these positions, giving him advice on these very important policy matters. Cheryl. Thanks. Um, the president's going to be traveling to Mexico later this week where he'll be talking about trade. Is the White House concerned at all that not having a commerce nominee or a U.S. trade nominee might hurt those talks at all? I would not expect that. I think uh, we have a, an excellent team that has worked on these issues uh, for a number of years now. And uh, we have obviously worked with the Mexican government closely on matters uh, of trade and uh, economic development. Uh, and in, in terms of specific personnel nominations, I don't have any announcements to make. Jay. Yeah, Jay, just a, one more on the sequester line of questioning. Haven't, by accepting the FAA, haven't you now opened the door so, to a bunch of folks coming along asking for a piece-by-piece -piece fix on the flexibility in a particular agency or budget line, but taken the pressure off for the very grand bargain balanced compromise that you say you want? No, because as I pointed out, piecemeal is not the way to fix the sequester. It would, it would, it would tax uh, uh, not just this Congress, uh, but any con Congress in history to go about the business of trying to fix this in a piecemeal fashion. It's not the way to do it. We should do it in a broad, uh, as part of a broad, balanced deal that reduces our deficit uh, and helps our economy grow through key investments. Well, on the first test, that's exactly what you did. You accepted piecemeal. I, I think I made clear that the President, as Secretary LaHood made clear to you guys two months ago, uh, was very concerned about this potential effect. He's also concerned about all these other effects, and he calls on Congress to show the same level of concern for parents of Head Start kids who are no longer enrolled in Head Start, or for seniors who are no longer getting Meals on Wheels, uh, or for military families who are, or, or families in military communities who uh, have experienced furloughs or job loss because of the sequester. Uh, and to take action accordingly. And the way to address all those problems is to replace the sequester with good policy, replace bad policy with good policy. Uh, that might be the job description in Congress, in fact. Let's, let's replace bad policy with good policy, and we encourage Congress to take that action and, you know, do away with the sequester that was never supposed to be uh, implemented in the first place. John Christopher. Okay. Uh, Sandy, six months plus. It seems uh, His Royal Highness uh, Prince Harry is coming over from Great Britain to visit with uh, Governor Christie in New Jersey, do a walkthrough of some of the damage. Uh, can you tell us if the President or anybody from this administration might be meeting with Prince Harry? I don't, I don't, I don't have any uh, meetings to announce. Uh, we obviously uh, welcome uh, the attention paid uh, on uh, the tremendous damage done by the storm uh, and the uh, ongoing efforts to recover in the region, uh, but I haven't got any meetings to announce. Thank you. Uh, Steve. Uh, the President has a lot of things in his budget that he considers good policy that are cuts, you know, mm -hmm. hundreds of billions of dollars in his own cuts that he's proposed as part mm -hmm. of the grand bargain, thinks is good policy. Why not use that to replace some of the sequester and some of these horrible things that you keep mentioning? Uh, it, and given that the Republicans are dug in on revenue, it doesn't seem like you're going to get any. Because the Republicans were sent here to work to solve problems, just like the President was and just like Democrats in Congress were. It is their responsibility to solve those problems in a way that's good for the whole country. And it is their responsibility to work cooperatively uh, to try to find common ground. Uh, that's what the President believes. And it is the wrong way uh, to reduce our deficit or eliminate the sequester uh, by simply saying, you know what? We'll just ask seniors to deal with it. We'll hold harmless millionaires and billionaires. We'll let those tax loopholes stay in place for uh, those who benefit or own corporate jets uh, or the oil and gas industry that has uh, made record progress in uh, pro uh, profits in recent years. Uh, we'll let them keep their taxpayer subsidies. We'll ask seniors to pay the bill for eliminating the sequester. That's, that's not the way this can happen. It's not the fair and right way, and it's not good policy. And that's why the President insists that we need to do this in a balanced way. That's what the American people say they want. That's what every bipartisan commission that's looked at this uh, has said that uh, is the right way to go. 
Uh, and that's why the President's engaged in these conversations with Republican lawmakers to see if common ground on this issue can be found. Uh, and, uh, you know, if we take that approach, uh, it will be uh, not just uh, good because it eliminates the sequester, uh, although that is a good thing. It will be good because it will send the signal to the country and the world uh, that we can work cooperatively in a way that the American people overwhelmingly support. Uh, it will be good for our economy. Uh, it will be good for the middle class and for seniors. Uh, these are all goals that supposedly uh, members of both parties on Capitol Hill share. Yep. Jay, on uh, Syrian chemical weapons, you say you want certainty. Is there a certainty, though, that uh, the United Nations, the Allies, NATO, and or the Arab League are going to go along and say, yeah, a red line has been crossed? Or is there a possibility of fracturing over this nebulous uh, quantitative measure or whatever? Well, I think we need to get uh, first steps first. And we are in the process of evaluating uh, evidence, collecting evidence, working with allies and partners and the Syrian opposition to uh, put together the necessary evidence that can be corroborated and reviewed and, uh, and in, the, in the aim of trying to establish whether or not the red line was crossed. Uh, I think it's pretty clear that we are not the only country that, uh, share, that has the concern here uh, about the possible use by the Assad regime of chemical weapons and the implications of that. Uh, and we will work with countries who share our concern uh, as we assess the facts that have been gathered and as we gather more facts. But what would be expected for the United States to say, yeah, the red line has been crossed, and then try to get, bring I, everybody I, I think it's, we've been pretty clear that uh, we made the point about the severity of this potential problem, the President did, and we have made clear that as it has become more evident that chemical weapons may have been used in Syria by the regime, uh, that we need to gather all the facts to, to decide whether or not that red line has been crossed and then, and then decide what policy implications flow from that. Uh, and uh, that's why we provided the information that we have to the Congress, and that's why we continue this work. Thanks, Jay. Evan in the back. Yeah, uh, you mentioned it's not the right way to go on sequester to do piecemeal, but will the White House accept more piecemeal fixes? Uh, it, are they going to push Congress to maybe do some piecemeal fixes for stuff like American Cancer Society is talking about fixes to try to make uh, more cancer research available. Is the White House going to push for stuff like that? I haven't seen uh, any proposals along the lines that you point out. But as, as the reason why I use the example that uh, Secretary Duncan had used in the past is, is that there are the reason, you know, there, when you have 80 plus billion dollars in across the board cuts in seven months with, with uh, exclusions. Uh, included in it that make the cu cuts where they take effect even more deep and severe, uh, there are no happy options, generally. In the FAA case, there was, uh, there was fun money that was unobligated for uh, essentially capital projects that could be transferred by an act of Congress only uh, to alleviate okay. the furloughs. Uh, but that uh, trade-off doesn't necessarily exist in many other places. And even then, there is a consequence. That means that when uh, regional airports, uh, are looking to fund capital projects, uh, they'll turn to the FAA and find that that, that money has been uh, used to avert the furloughs. And, and there will be economic consequences to that. So uh, even in this case, there is uh, a negative impact of trying to solve the sequester in the way that, uh, that it's been solved for this particular issue. The right way to do this is simply to uh, agree to approach our deficits uh, in a balanced way, reduce them in a balanced way. Uh, and ask the wealthiest and well-connected to uh, have some skin in this game, to not – I mean, what's amazing to me when you, when you look at the, the budget that the House Republicans passed and, and the calls you now see for tax reform uh, that would uh, not just close some loopholes and cap some deductions, but give a substantial tax cut to the wealthiest Americans. You wonder if there really is seriousness uh, among Republicans who claim to be concerned about deficits and debt, uh, because the numbers just don't add up. The right way to do this is through a balanced approach that includes uh, savings from entitlement reforms, savings from spending cuts, and savings through tax reform. And that's the, the way that the President has proposed we do it. Uh, many others have said that's the right way to do it. And at varying times, Republican leaders have said they would be willing to do that. 
but now they say no, and uh, that is not how it should be. But you would sign more piecemeal fixes yeah, if they came? I, I, you're, you're asking me to speculate on bills that don't even exist. I think that we've made clear that this is not the right way to go about it. It doesn't solve the overall problem. We welcome the opportunity to alleviate this specific problem. Uh, but there are many, many other impacts, including the macro impact. I mean, solving half of 1 percent of this problem doesn't get you very far in uh, saving those 750,000 jobs or uh, eliminating the 0.6 percent drag on our economic growth. Uh, we need to do this in the right way, uh, and that's the way the American people expect us to do it. Thanks very much.